You know, many people say, oh, we need Christians in all the mountains of influence. And some of us, we, that is right. But we laugh when we hear it. What Christians do you want to send there? Do you know the spirits that govern those mountains? Hi, I am Confidence Moses. Welcome to Premium Niger TV. Hello guys, welcome back to Premium Niger TV. My name is Ebenezer Peyong. Well, if you are coming across our channel for the first time, please hit the subscribe button and click on the bell icon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a brand new seminar from Apostle Michael Oropo. And this one is about why some of our Christians that are in governments are not looking back at the Christian community that they came out from, people that voted them in there. And you know, this is one question that Christians are always asking. I believe you have something to learn from this seminar. So kindly pay attention to this particular message and after that you tell us what you have to say about this in the comments section everyone who has the life of god is a child of god but as many as are led some of us are led by good stories some of us are led by our emotions some of us are led by the promises of men that's why even the location where we are currently somebody suggested it as a place of greener pasture but the last man that journeyed like that his name is god lord he ended up in a city that was burnt down. But not sons. When Lot wanted to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, he saw the plains of Sodom that it was full of green vegetation. And he said, this is the best place. But when Abraham wanted to move, the Bible said he looked up to heaven. That's the difference between Abraham and Lot. Lot is, le is led by facts and opportunities. Abraham is led by the voice of Abba. So a generation must rise that say, oh, this thing looks good, but God has not spoken to me. If we don't have that kind of generation, we won't have sons. You know why? Because when the boat becomes turbulent, what will keep you standing is the voice of God. He said, my God, whom I am and whom I serve, stood by me yesterday and said, there shall be no loss of life. Cheer up. That's a son talking. He has access to the voice. And Jesus was teaching in John 10, 27. He said, my sheep. And I told you there's a difference between a sheep and a lamb. A lamb does not know the voice of the shepherd. It follows the bleating of the sheep. That's why most of you, anything that looks as if it's spiritual, you follow it. Because you don't know the voice of the shepherd. He said, my sheep heareth my voice and they obey. Those are sons. So no matter how the thing is presented, if God does not speak, I'm not involved. You have become a son. I said the third thing that defines a son is that a son has the capacity to endure the chastening of the father. In Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 6 to 8, the Bible began to show us. It said, if we are not bastards, but sons, then we are going to endure the chastening of the Lord. It said, we have earthly parents that chastise us and we obey them. It said, how much more shall we obey the chastening of our father or of our Lord or the father of all spirits so that we may live? So a man cannot live as an agent of Zion except as God can chastise him. Even Jesus, the Bible said, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So when you become a son, there are many disciplines, rigid routines that God will carry you through so that you are formed. The problem is that most of us are not formed. And that's why God pampers us. Because if God wants to deal with you, you will go. You will leave church and become angry. This type of church, I will not go again. This type of God, I won't serve. Why did I ask for this? It wasn't answered. Why did I do this? And this didn't happen. You are a baby. Because the zenith of your Christianity is what you can receive from God. But when some people mature, they become happy when God can discipline them. Most of you who work in organizations where the routine is rigid, hope you know that you are changed even before you enter. I'm seeing my son there. He's a captain in the army. Were you like this five years ago? Well, when you join the army, that should be like 15 years now. The man has transformed. A friend of mine from school back then, who was the weakest of us, in fact, he couldn't even play football because when we hit him, he would go and fall or move back. <laughs> Some of us, we were operating like Michael Balak. <laughs> we would come with. <laughs> the guy is in the army now. We were joking the other day and I hit him. <laughs> When I hit him, I went back. He did like this. <laughs> What's going on here? That was not the man we met in the university. The rigid routine of the army changed him. Even the muscles have become altered because he has gone through a process. That process will not bend. 
That's why the Bible said, the standard of the law standeth short. He said, therefore the Lord knoweth them that are his. There are people that God calls his own. He said, those men, they are the people who have purged themselves. They have gone through the routine. See, there are times when you want to eat, the Holy Ghost said no. It's not because eating is a sin, but you are in a school. You are being trained. There are times when you offend somebody or you insult somebody. The Holy Ghost will tell you, you must go and apologize publicly. You will send the person the message, that thing that happened, just forget. He said, no, no, that is not what I said. You will go and apologize because your ego must be crushed. Your ego. Now, this is unique to you. It's not a syllabus for everybody. But he knows what is chastising inside you. There are times when you come to a place because you are no rhetor. You want everybody to know you know how to talk. He will now say, go and join the sanitary unit. You will be there for two years. Meanwhile, the pastor is preaching. You say, what is he talking? If I carry that microphone for three minutes, everybody will know. <laughs> they are not looking for talkers. They are looking for men of rank, men of authority. So the Holy Ghost knows that you can talk, but he said, be in the, in the bathroom. You'll be washing bathroom in conferences like this. You won't even wear a suit. You want to sit in front, let everybody know, because even your physique makes you look like an apostle. And you have some suit you want to wear and walk in like a man who operates in the third heaven. He said, join those in the toilet. And you'll be in the bathroom. You'll be, you'll be angry, mopping, but that is sonship. Is the chastening. And then to make things worse, people will use it and not flush well. You will come and say, what kind of thing is this? Everywhere will be silent. That's why you are there. Until you start doing it with joy, you have not graduated. This one is not about, I can pray in tongues for 10 hours. You can pray in tongues and be a baby. Because there are many tonguing Pharisees. <laughs> Didn't you hear about the Pharisees? They love to pray for long and start by street corner so that men will know that they are men of prayer. Have you not seen them in our generation? When people pray, they walk like this. They have prayed. <laughs> Prayer alters you. It affects your posture. It affects a lot of things about you. But if it's about a show, you have gotten your reward. And it means you are a baby because you are a Pharisee. You are not an agent of the kingdom. You don't see sometimes God does not train you for spiritual things through spiritual process. God can train you for a spiritual thing through a secular process. In that your banking job, he can tell you don't come late. Don't change any figure. And you will do it. Men will persecute you for five years. That's your training. At the end of the day, he has built something into you that can never be taken from you. His sonship. It's called the chastening of the Lord. And no matter how you pray, he won't lower the standard. Because you are being raised as a savior. So that you can become a son. I'm telling you why most of you are gifted. But your generation has not heard you. Because you have not allowed God to chastise you. You have not allowed him. You spoke against somebody, he said, apologize. You refuse. Say over my dead body. <laughs> you, you will see something. No? Because you will die and discover in heaven that you had a great calling on earth that was not fulfilled. I'm telling you, it's the chastening of the Lord. And then number four, a son is one who can bear God's government. That means you come to a point of self-denial. You are no longer living for yourself. You are living only to serve the will of the father that's what jesus demonstrated in gethsemane he said father if it were possible he told us clearly it was not his will he said let this cup pass me that by yet not my will but thine that's sonship because in john 3 16 the bible told us already for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so god gave him to die so even though it was not consistent with his will, he submitted to the will of the Father so that he can bear the government of heaven. That is what sonship is about. If we don't raise people who understand self-denial as a code of life, we are in trouble. And I was telling you yesterday, even some of us that God has already entrusted the sacred responsibility of ministry, we think ministry is a merchant ground. You invite somebody to come and preach, you say, my B is three million. Your B come and sing he say uh, it's five million are you joking your bill p 
people like Paul, the Bible said in Acts chapter 15 verse 26, it said these were men that hazarded their lives for the gospel. They, they exposed themselves to risk for the sake of the gospel. If you read it from verse 25, it said Paul and Barnabas, these were men that hazarded their lives for the gospel. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think verse 18, Paul said, I preach the gospel free of charge. In fact, he said, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. He said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. He is putting a curse on himself. If he doesn't preach, necessity is laid upon me. And we have a generation where people charge to sing. People charge to preach. And when you ask them, they say, they have a lot of things to handle. They have this to pay. They have that to pay. There is backup here. There is this. If there is no money to pay backup, cut them down. The glory is not in backup. You are not a star to sing. You are not a, a musician. You are a worshiper. God has put something on you to bring down the presence of God. When you come to a level where you can comfortably get backups, get them. And when that time comes, God will put honor on your life. You don't need to struggle. It will happen. There are men today who go to places, they just make one appearance. They give them monies that some people can't earn in five years. They have grown to that level of honor. It's not a bargain. It's God that puts honor on men. If you service your gift well, your honor level will go up. And if you want to carry 30 backups, you'll be able to carry them. But if you are not yet there, don't put yourself there. In the kingdom, God promotes men. And one of the laws for promotion is faithfulness another one is diligence another one is brokenness and humility so obey those laws exalt your horn and when your horn is exalted everything you are looking for he said i've not called the seed of jacob to seek me in vain but the seed of jacob is not called to bargain and put a charge on service in the house of god if that begins to happen then we are hirelings we are not sons and so the first rank of saviors in this kingdom is the rank of sonship. Men that can reveal God. Men that are led exclusively by the voice of God. Men that can endure the chastening of the Lord. And men that can bear God's government because self-denial has become their way of life. When you become a son, then God promotes you I'm showing you realms, realms of saviors. And that's why I called it spiritual ranking. Listen, all of us are born again. In salvation, we are equal. But in kingdom equation, we are not the same. Please don't make the mistake of thinking we are the same. A man that God has processed for 15 years, you think God will rate that man same with another man who has worked in rebellion for 15 years. <laughs> are you joking? There are certain men that when they talk, God puts his credibility upon them. Their walls can't fall to the ground. God needs such men to save cities. God needs such men to defend his agenda in generations. See, it's not everything that is about revelation. You can quote a thousand and one scripture. It doesn't translate to authority. There is a level of authority you can weed through revelation. But there are other authorities that your loyalty and submission to God, proven over time, is what we give it to you. This thing, because we have platforms on Facebook and we come to talk things, it's a joke. There are men today that if they die, Christianity will be marginalized in this country. The reason many rulers who are outrightly against Christianity are afraid of taking certain action is because some men are present. They can call them and say, this won't happen. And if they like it or not, it will still not happen. So because of those men, there are many things that are not happening. Why do you think, see, some of you who are even in other cities, like the northern cities, the reason some of you are at peace is because there are two, three men in the body of Christ today that if they rise up and speak, things will go wrong. So because of their presence, these guys hold their peace. Did you not read Colossians 4.12? It says, Epaphras is one of you, a born servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. This guy was not in Colossus, but it was his engagement in the spirit 
that made Christianity to flourish in Colossus. You will now come and say, but all of us are born again. You are joking. Do you know the labors of the spirit that Epaphras puts on the table? It's because of Epaphras that men are walking in perfection in Colossus. That means the whole of that city depends on his spiritual engagement. As far as God's kingdom is concerned, that man is more important than a hundred believers. Because he's not just a believer, he's an agent of the kingdom. And I tell you, the first place to start from is to start growing into sonship. That means you must labor in the world, in prayer, until your life and your character begins to reveal God. So that when you come to a place, let men know that God has a voice there. You must labor until the Holy Ghost begins to lead you. That when you do things, it's because God spoke, not because you are intelligent. You must labor to come to a point where you submit to the dealings of God. When God speaks to you, it may be hard, but you ask for the grace to obey. And you must labor to come to a point where you no longer live for yourself. You live only for God's agenda. Self-denial becomes a way of life. So that you mature from a child to a son. When you now mature to a son, then God promotes you further to becoming a priest. Because this ranking are in sequence. You are a son, you are a priest, and you are a king. But you see, most of us have not even grown into sonship. That's why we can't do priesthood. Because it's in priesthood that the real legislation over people and over territory begins. When you are dealing at the level of sonship, it's about your own alignment to God. But when you enter priesthood, it's no longer about you. It's about the people and it's about the territory. But if God has not been able to conquer you, how can he use you to conquer the territory? So Tonight, priesthood I comes to talk to us about the subject of spiritual ranking. Because of what we are dealing with, you know, I try to follow the team of conferences that I'm invited to because I believe that's the prophetic word God is telling the people and that was what they isolated from the oracles of God for the time. So sometimes I come to a territory, I come with a lot, but I streamline myself except as the Holy Ghost commands me otherwise. And so the emphasis God is raising at this time is the things that happen to those who come up from Mount Zion. Because God's servant has titled this conference Upon Mount Zion. And I began yesterday by telling us that there are men with diverse graces and potentials who have been shut down not because of the difficulty of the geographical territory where they are, but because of the spirit city that regulates that territory. Because every geographical enclave is actually under the government of a spiritual atmosphere. And that's why I highlighted yesterday by telling you, although Caleb had the power to take over mountains, but Egypt swallowed that dimension. It was until he came out of Egypt that he began to tell us that in his DNA was a warrior. And he referenced that at 80, he could do what he would, he would be able to do at 40. He could take over mountains because his strength was intact. But it will shock you that that kind of man was in Egypt and was not manifesting anything. It was when they came out of Egypt that we discovered that Joshua had within him the capacity to conquer 31 kingdoms. But he was roaming Egypt as a young lad who had no destination. So people have enormous potentials, but spiritual cities can shut them down. We saw that Miriam was a prophetess, a woman that had the capacity to pipe frequencies from heaven, prophetic sounds that could open up many dimensions. But she was in Egypt and all she had, her greatest rank in Egypt, was a nanny. And after she did that job of a nanny for Moses, supporting her mother, the story ended. Nobody knew that a prophetic horn was upon that woman. But the moment they came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, Miriam began to prophesy. And so we saw that spirit cities could shut down the potentials of even the greatest among us. And when you read Isaiah chapter 19, you are going to discover that Egypt is not just a territory. 
Egypt is an architecture orchestrated by a spirit of slavery. So the Bible spoke about the spirit of Egypt. And that's why when God wanted to deliver them, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, he said, tonight I will pass through Egypt and I will judge, not Pharaoh. Pharaoh is, is a toddler, is a puppet that mirrors the dimension of the spirit that rules the territory. He said, I will judge the gods of Egypt. I will kill the firstborn sons and he said, Pharaoh will let you go. So Pharaoh was there attending to the demands of the spirit that created the city that ruled the people of God. And I told you about Babylon. When you study Daniel chapter 9 and 10, you are going to find that there was a prince called the Prince of Persia that created an atmosphere around that territory. And that prince was the one who determined the outcome of the destinies of people. And they were in captivity there, great potentials, yet nothing manifested as far as they were there. Because that was also a city. And when you study Babylon carefully, you discover that Babylon and Shina are the same thing. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10 speaks about Babel and Shina. Those were the same territory. So when you talk of Babylon, Babel, you are talking, talk of Shina, you are talking the same thing. And so the spirit that controls that territory is the spirit of Nimrod. An appetite for greatness on the strength of compromise. So anywhere you see people easily compromise in order to become great, know that Babylon is at work. And these are the forces that are regulating people today who are supposed to be in another city. Anywhere you see corruption and mixture, know that Babylon is there because although Jezebel was the wife of Ahab in the flesh, the spirit of Jezebel also controls Babylon. It's the spirit of seduction, it's the spirit of idolatry, and it's the spirit of mixture and corruption. That's what controls Babylon. So when you find people who do have great potentials, but they can't tame their appetites, know that they are under the government of a spirit city. And it doesn't matter the title they have. These are, these are cities. They compel men to slavery. And there are many of such cities, like Assyria, like Rome. These are different governments that enslave God's people. And if I have time to do a deep teaching, I would have shown you the peculiarity of all of these cities and how to war with them. But that's not our focus. Our focus is Mount Zion. And when we study Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 22, we now discover that Mount Zion is also a city. It says, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, you and I are on earth in Kaduna, geographically speaking. But the Bible says we are in Mount Zion. That means your geographical location is not your only location. In fact, your real location is the city that regulates you. So there are men who are in Boko, in Makodi, in Lagos, but they are in Babylon. They are in Egypt. He said, but for those of us who are born again, he said, we are in Mount Zion. But the problem is that some people have been brought to Mount Zion, but they are not functioning with Mount Zion. Because the challenge here is that you can come out of Egypt, yet carry Egypt in your heart. That's the complexity of spirit cities. So theologically speaking, men, men are in Mount Zion, but Babylon is in their heart. Egypt is in their heart, so they are slaves. That's why the Bible says, Woe unto him who is at ease in Zion. Because Zion has its own technology. He said, let no one in Zion say, I am sick. So there are many who in Christ are already brought to Zion, but Babylon is in their heart. Egypt is in their heart. That's why they are not fulfilling God's agenda. And so the scripture God gave my brother is from Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17. He said, upon Mount Zion, he said, there shall be deliverance. <laughs> because God needs to remove the influence and the impact of the demonic cities regulating your destiny from you. In Christ, he has removed you from the city. But you need a deliverance to remove the city from you. Because it's one thing to come out of Egypt. It's another thing for Egypt to come out of you. So what God did for us in Christ was to remove us from the cities. But what he's doing in the Holy Ghost is to remove the city from us. That's why I say, upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. 
when deliverance is accomplished he said now there shall be holiness that means you begin to live by the laws and the dictates of zion because if you don't function like a zionite you cannot inherit the wealth of zion because after you live holy he said then the sons of jacob shall possess their possession now there are many people in christ who have egypt in their heart babylon in their heart and they are declaring all of the blessings and they are not seeing it and it looks as if the bible is a very a book of fairy tales is because they've not allowed deliverance to happen you know the way god did dealt with them in who came out of egypt they went through the desert they went through the wilderness and god began to teach them experiential knowledge he told them he suffered them to hunger so that they will know that man shall not live by bread alone so if they didn't go through the, the the wilderness to understand the syllables of hunger they wouldn't know the significance of the word of god so the reason god carried them through hunger in the wilderness is to teach them that your dependence is on every word that proceeds from the mouth of god and that was the civilization jesus carried when satan met him if you are the son of god turn this stone to bread he was suggesting to him greatness that's babylonian system if you say you are great turn this stone to bread and jesus said no man shall not live by bread alone he knows the syllables of zion he has been taught how to function in the city of god so you are delivered then you function by the laws of zion then you receive your inheritance but the goal of the inheritance is not for you to celebrate what you have the moment god gives you your inheritance in verse 21 of that scripture he say you are now sent as a savior he said for saviors shall come out from mount zion why to judge the mountains of Esau. so everyone who is born again must not stop at the level of receiving what christ has made available he must grow in rank until he builds capacity to become god's extension on the earth to judge evil and to judge iniquity the reason we are gathered in this conference is to teach us the dynamics of rising into the rank of saviors so that we can bring judgment upon the mountains of Esau. you know many people say oh we need christians you know the mountains of influence and some of us we that is right but we laugh when we hear it what christians do you want to send there do you know the spirits that govern those mountains do you know the powers that rule the government the thrones that you see you think the position of a senator the position of a governor the position of a president is just a seat <laughs> you are joking there are spiritual governors that watch over those thrones the moment you see there are many men the moment they sat on those thrones they became confused for four years it's when they came out of office that they asked themselves what were we doing <laughs> because they, uh, this <laughs> oh my goodness my goodness my goodness now i'm not trying to exonerate them from taking the blame they share in the blame because they are expected to have built character they, they are expected to have built compliance to be able to function on those thrones so the reason they didn't succeed part of it is their error but i'm also telling you that there are principalities in the realm that watch over thrones so before you say let's send christians to to academics let's send christians to government ask yourself what is the quality of the christians you are talking about somebody becomes senator and two weeks later the moment they finish swearing in they sit down and say there is 10 billion here is for your constituency but who cares you can take five billion <laughs> and this is somebody who has never seen 100 million the moment they say five billion do you know what is happening to his head he's looking at bahamas he's looking at dubai he's looking at lamborghini he's looking at rolls royce that's all they think he's thinking of the fleet of cars and the buildings he will have in five nations if you like advise him for five years he will not hear one until he leaves that office because he he has come under a pressure that his soul is not used to he has not been trained to comply to the laws of zion that five billion will shake him because he will start imagining himself walk and enter a rolls royce in fact he needs three first there must be three black rolls royce before he feels it's okay 
because another city has been introduced to him and he will begin to judge his value based on cars buildings and the places he travel to is that the man you want to tell that there are poor people in your village you don't know what you are saying that throne has the power to colonize you this is why before we talk about esau the mountains of esau men must grow to become saviors so the goal of this conference is to teach you how to become a savior and yesterday i told you the first rank you attain to be a savior is that you must become a son and so we read that from matthew chapter 1 verse 21 he said <laughs> you know this is an apostolic conference it's a place where men are built up so that they gain strength matthew chapter 1 verse 21 do we have it he said and she shall bring forth this is the angel gabriel talking to joseph your wife has been appointed from the courts of heaven to be the conveyor of one who will come from zion to the earth realm because we have not understood how the people who come from zion function so they needed to send us a prototype personality that will show us the order and the operations of savior so they said we will shoot one from the zions of heaven so that he will educate you how to live and he said that one will come through a virgin because if she come if he comes through biological process it's not going to be the son of god we need the son of god to come so the seed of man will not be deployed and he said a virgin shall bring forth a what not a child oh. when you are talking government and kingdom it's not children oh, it's sons a virgin shall give birth to a son and thou shalt call his name jesus why for he shall save his people from their sins so i told you that this salvation here is exclusively salvation from sin but there are different dimensions to salvation that other saviors will collaborate with jesus to carry out that dimension is what the bible is showing us in obadiah chapter 1 verse 21 that from mount zion saviors this is the first savior but others who are saved will now be launched as saviors but they can never go out as saviors except as they become sons because isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 he said unto us a child is born a son is given and the moment that child becomes a son he said the government of this world shall be upon his shoulder so you can't challenge cities you can't challenge the mountains of Esau. You cannot function as a savior except as you metamorphose from a child into a son. But the unfortunate thing is that we are too interested in church membership that we are no longer raising sons. Discipleship has been removed from our doctrine. So what we have are church members. And that's why all our programs are designed to satisfy church members. From miracle service, to prophetic service and we do that from january to december now i do miracle service because you always have children but if all our operation sunday to sunday is your name is matthew your name is Mata, you came from congo or every service is we are laying hands to heal the sick hey cancer gone and it's all about healing you have children who only run to god for what god has to give you will not have men who will ask god what will you have me do so men must grow from children to become sons if they can do the business of zion because zion has a business zion has an agenda upon which men must be sent so that they can function as saviors in their generation and i told you you are a child because you have the life of god that's what makes you a child god gave you his life so that you can become a child of god he said in first john chapter 5 from verse 11 to 13 he said this is the record god has given us eternal life and he said that life is in his son he said whoever has the son has life he said these things have i written unto you that believe on the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life so anybody who has christ has been given the life of god that life is what makes you a child of god so every one of us who is born again is a child of god but when we are dealing with sonship you need certain levels of maturity because like i told you yesterday there are four basic things that define who a son is i said the first thing that defines a son is that a son comes to a point where he has the capacity to reveal god some of you who are here if we follow you to your office and call you man of god all your colleague with, colleagues will talk who is man of god this person 
<laughs> they will say that's not the God of the Bible. Because me and this one took bribe yesterday. Yesterday. And it's not a mistake. We do we have done it for five years. <laughs> they call you man of woman of God. Somebody who's woman of who? Now, man of God is not a preacher. Man of God means a representative of God. One who comes from God to represent God. If they call you woman of God, people will start laughing. We will think it's testimony that they will say this one. This one that can finish one bottle of alcohol. It's around 12 midnight. She dances in the club. Everybody know Is that the person? Now, you now say that person will take the bank. That person will take the army. You say that person will take government. You are joking. You don't know the powers that were there. And so a generation must be prepared. But for that to happen, sons must be born. And son, sonship is not a gender thing. It's not male or female. A son, number one, is one who can reflect God. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3 says, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He says, He has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and by whom the worlds were made. He said, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, so the moment people can see you and see God, you have become a son. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And he was not the only one talking like that. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In 1 John 4 17, John said, as he is, so are we in this world. So we have come to a point where we can mirror the Father. Because we are sons of God. If we don't raise Christians that resemble God then what we are doing at some point will become a social gathering the second thing that makes you a son is that you are now function by the leading of the holy spirit in romans 8 14 he said as many as are led by the spirit of god he said they are the sons of god not the children of god everyone who has the life of god is a child of god but as many as are led hello guys so what do you have to say about this beautiful sermon eyes opening sermon so please drop it in the comment section don't forget to subscribe to premium niger tv and also click on the bell icon for more